Hello, and welcome back to Franklin Covey's weekly leadership podcast on leadership with Scott Miller. That's me. I'm privileged to be your host and interviewer each week of what is now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, five years, 250 plus episodes. And when we first started this podcast, we thought, well, maybe every couple of weeks we'll have an outside celebrity, thought leader, business titan, author. And as we got bigger and bigger across the world in terms of our impact, we realized that sometimes it was even even those without a household name, someone that had actually survived a tragedy or uh, done some research that could change your role as a leader were often our best guests. And now 250 episodes in, I'm delighted to turn the spotlight back onto two of my very dear friends. I've known them for over two decades. They are two of the four authors of Franklin Covey's newest release coming out today, simply titled Change. Change, the tagline is how to Turn Uncertainty into Opportunity. This book is authored by four Franklin Covey thought leaders, Curtis Bateman, Marche Plachette, Andy Sinrich, and Dr. Christy Phillips. And on behalf of two of their colleagues, Marche and Andy are joining me today in studio. Welcome to both of you to On Leadership. Marche, so great to see you. Very excited to be here. Andy, glad you're here. Thanks for the invite. You've come in from Atlanta. Andy's a hometown boy here from Utah. Excited today to get a hold and talk about your newest book. I don't know about you, but my first book, I slept with it under my pillow the first time <laughs> it came out. So when you're launching this book today, I hope that you take some time to- I might do that. Take some snapshots, put it in bed with I you, right? It. Take it out the next day, right? But more than one night might be creepy, but I think you should be so proud. You and Dr. Phillips and Curtis Bateman have been really dedicated your careers to this topic of how to build better leadership, how to create cultures of high trust worthiness, a bias towards execution. And we know that some of us have been through change a little bit the last couple of years, massive understatement, but you've both co-authored a masterpiece. This book is both aimed at all levels of leadership, first time leaders, frontline leaders, mid-level leaders, senior executive leaders. You both have been ambassadors of our firm for how, how many years, Marche, for you? It has been over 16 years now. 16 years, Andy? 18 and 18, your boat's just kind of scratching the 20-year mark. Recently, you won the one of the largest awards our company has to author. Talk a bit about that. Yeah, so it's the 1,500-day yes. club, which means that I have delivered over 1,500 sessions, yes. uh, development sessions, and it was a surprise and absolutely an honor because it means it translates to thousands and thousands of people that I've actually encountered, interacted with. Yes. I've learned from them as much as they have learned from In me. literally a life-size vase. I saw you holding it. Yes. It was like four feet long or yeah. such. Andy, isn't it time you won the same award? Well, I actually I win that have. about 10 years ago. Uh, sorry. So, meaning Marche has a life. And she <laughs> says we're on the road, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, congrats to both of you for being two of the most influential uh, thought leaders and consultants at Franklin Covey. Marche, talk a bit about why you chose to put your name. Of all the books you could have co-authored or authored, yeah. why did you chose to align with this book? Yes. So, you know, just... First of all, I am someone who absolutely believes in the greatness in everyone, and that is not just hyperbole. I think that we all have the ability to be great. Now, what happens in us becoming great is it's a process of growth. It's a process of, of, uh, of change, and it's inevitable period for us all, whether it's professional uh, change or personal change. And as a facilitator, a senior delivery consultant at Franklin Covey, as well as a leadership coach. It's all about change, helping people to work through the process of change. And that's what this is about. Personally and professionally as well. Andy, the book is unusual for Franklin Covey in a good way in that it's highly illustrative, right? There's great illustrations, great models. You don't go a page or two without some kind of call out or visual orientation, which all of us enjoy. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what's also interesting about the book is it includes a parable. The first time Franklin Covey's ever written a parable or a short story, will you just take a minute or two and walk us through why did you include a parable in the book and maybe talk about what the nature of the parable is? What's the learning from it? Yeah, so I think the parables are awesome in the fact that they have multiple levels to them. You can read them and get multiple interpretations and value from them. And one of the things that I found as I shared this parable with early focus groups, and this was family, friends, 
I was amazed at the insights that people had when they read and listened to this parable. And so the learning that it stimulated in people was amazing. And it's just a simple journey, right? It's just this ship that's going down a, a river with a bunch of different unique characters on it and things don't go well. And you watch as they wrestle with this unanticipated change and you see that all of the different responses to the change are valued in them coming out of it having been better for going through the change than had they never gone through it before and just sailed along their merry way. And that's what I love about the parable. I think the parable adds such a great setup for the book because it's aligned with the change model. We'll talk about it in a moment. But there's also these characters on this boat that we all can identify with. Yeah. If you're mildly self-aware, you say, oh, that's me, and that's my leader, and that's Jim over in marketing and Stephanie in operations. So I like the courage you all took with your co-authors to start with this parable and then kind of have it infuse the rest of the book. Marche, the book has lots of great stories in it about surviving change, thriving in change, avoiding it, hanging on to it, clinging to it, mm -hmm. moving through it. All of the authors share some call outs from their own life, mm -hmm. whether it be personally, or professionally. What's one of your favorite stories from the book? Maybe one that you contributed or one from your yeah. colleagues? So interestingly, it, the, my favorite one is not one that I wrote. Hmm. It is uh, one that Curtis Bateman shared about how when he was um, starting to drive, his father, he was you know, driving in an, an unlit area, and his father says to him, look out for the, the deer, right? That may potentially run into the, yeah. the road. And he's saying he was like holding the steering wheel, he's looking out for deer. His father tells him to kind of look out for the glassy eyes, and he said, sure enough, he saw them. And he was able to slow down just a little bit um, as not to you know, run into them if they run into the, 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 the pathway. But his story was really one that says, as leaders, we should be prepared for yeah. change, looking out for change, because if we can do that, if we look out for change, we can actually then prepare our team members to look out for the change that happens. And we're not freaked out about it. We're not afraid. We're not like um, when change happens, like this is happening and everybody's hair is on fire. He talks about if somebody was in the back seat. Well, that's a bad thing you're saying. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> If someone was in the back seat, you know, it's like we make the transition and the deer are coming. We slow down a little bit. They cross the road and we journey on. Um, and it's the same thing. I just that has stuck with me um, because I just think that it's a good analogy. It's a good metaphor for how as leaders, if we can be prepared for what's happening and if and, and by the way, this kind of carries on just a little bit further. If we could be prepared and if we could think about what change feels like for us right? Um, then we can be more empathetic when our people go through change as well. Side note, after my wife delivered our third son and final son, I mm -hmm. bought her the best car I could afford, mm -hmm. a nice car. And she let me drive it once. I was coming home from the grocery store and a deer ran out and hit ah. the side of the car. Of course, it was all my fault. I'm like, this deer ran against the car. <laughs> I should have been, huh? been looking for the eyes. For yeah. Uh, Andy, this adage that change is the new normal, that there's, we're always going to be in change is very much present. And the book is structured around what Franklin Covey calls their change model. Yeah kind of intentionally rudimentary, yeah. fairly elementary. In fact, in many ways, you've co-authored this book not for the change expert, not for the person who has the PhD in organizational development or change management, because there's a whole industry around that that's very valuable. But the fact of the matter is, most leaders don't have time to be heavily steeped in change pedagogy. I'm gonna walk you through the, the change model and have me have you give me a couple of insights on how people can relate to it. So kind of think of a bit of a bell curve or such. The first aspect of the change model, you call it the zone of status quo. Talk about that. Man, it's the thing that all of us want, mm -hmm. right? We're trying to get to where things are the same and stable. Leave me alone. Which it's all yeah, good. like we've been we've already dealt with this, we're in a good place. And our premise is look, you know change is coming, let's get ready for it. Let's use this zone when we're comfortable to get ready for the next thing and develop some competency so that when change, which is inevitable, comes, we're ready to rock it. Yeah, in multiple change at multiple times. Yeah. It's as if one storm might be coming. It might be August in Florida, where there's yeah. three or four storms that are brewing, brewing right. and you need to be prepared for it. Okay, yeah. the first is the zone of status quo. It's don't rest on your laurels. Use this time to prepare for inevitability coming your exactly. way. Exactly. 
Uh, second is the zone of disruption. Keep going. Yeah. So it's just life is everything's great. And then all of a sudden, well, look, sometimes it happens to us, right? Sometimes it's a global pandemic. Sometimes it's a competitive change. Sometimes our organization gets restructured and we have a new leader and we didn't really dig them that much. But other times we choose the change. It's like a strategic thing for us to make a change, to do a reorganization, to uh, go after a new market, to you know push new products or whatever. And I think this is the thing where it's always going to cause a dip in results. That's the thing we have to, it doesn't matter whether we choose the disruption or it just happens to us, there's going to be a disruption. Our job as leaders is to get people on our team, anybody that we can influence, to, to choose to adapt to the change. And that's cool, you don't choose the change, but you can choose, and I think it aligns really well with the first habit of highly effective people from Dr. Covey. Don't choose the circumstances, you get to choose your response to it. That's right. I think it's sometimes we don't know that we chose this change. It might be uh, we were negligent about something or didn't prepare properly for it, or there was, Great point. there was some decision we made that resulted in change we weren't expecting. Mm. I also think this is the, my favorite part of the book, because if you look at the visual change model, this part, the zone of disruption, is like a, it's like a squiggly, right? It's like all over the place. Yeah. And it really helps you, Marche, to learn to become comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's panic. It's, 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 it's wild, you know, mismatch of exercises and initiatives. It's kind of gave me permission to realize, okay, so I'm kind of supposed to be uncomfortable. Yeah. It is confusing. But that's yeah. actually the, the squiggly line, the spaghetti bowl is actually in the zone of adoption. That's, that's adoption. after you get to oh, the point well, of decision. I moved it Then forward, it gets ugly. But it's how I felt. Uh, well, but okay. That's how I felt. So, right? I'm, I'm all confused. What do I yeah. do? I don't understand. Right. Well, in truth, in the zone of disruption, it doesn't matter if the change is proposed as something that's going to be amazing, right? Which most of the time when change yeah. happens, your leader or whoever, or even if it's us, we're thinking, this is going to be better. We're doing this for something better. It doesn't matter how great it is, there is going to be a dip. If you win a new car, if you won a new car, right, there's still going to be this dip. You've got to figure out how does it work. This is a little bit different. If it's an electric car, you got to get you know up to speed. Get <laughs> pay the, the taxes yeah, on it, even though you want it. Pay the taxes on it, right? So in the zone of disruption, it really is a change from what Andy just described as the zone of status quo. Everything that we know so awesomely, and in the you know in the workplace, sometimes we've been experts at something, and suddenly you're not. Right? right, so it, full, right. it pulls the rug from beneath you. Or when change is forced on you. I think I read in the book a, a, a quote that stuck with me that said, everyone loves change when it's their idea. That's right. right? When it's their idea and <laughs> right. you thought it through. Right. Andy, let's keep going. And feel free to keep schooling me on which okay. ones I'm getting wrong. It's okay. You're yeah. good. You're good. Every, every interviewer's greatest um, joy. <laughs> uh, I deserve that. Okay, zone of status quo, zone of disruption. Next is the point of decision. It's kind of a, 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 a point in there. I, mean, yeah. I guess you have to like decide up or out. Yeah, this is the thing, you get to take control. That's and right. you might not have chosen anything to do with the change, but at this point you say, I'm gonna own the change instead of being owned by it. And as soon as you do that, there's a freedom that comes mm -hmm. with like, okay, this isn't happening to me anymore. It's something that has happened, mm -hmm. but now I'm gonna take this, this difficult, challenging, emotional, whatever it is, I'm gonna do something positive with it. And, and I think there's a little bit of a thing, like we think that when we make that decision, everything's good. But you spoke to it earlier, mm -hmm. that's when the spaghetti bowl happens. And I think as leaders, we need to be recognizing that, yes, you get people to the point of decision, they understand what's happening and why they choose to adopt to the change, then it gets ugly. Mm. And it's gonna be ugly for a minute and we have to help people persist despite the adversity and the obstacles that they're right. facing. I think some leaders give up too early in the process. I kinda wish I had this book, Marche, 15 years ago. I had a 25 year career at Franklin Covey. I left the firm as an officer and now I'm an ambassador mm -hmm. for the organization. But I've been through so many acquisitions, divestitures, realignments, new product launches, contractions, expansions, mm -hmm. changes in business, business model, some of which I owned and some I didn't. Mm -hmm. Some were forced upon me and some of which I resisted. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, shut down. Because yeah. I had either power or budget or title. And had I had this model, just the visual model, I would have said, oh, I'm here. And the company needs me to be there, and I have a choice of whether or not I'm gonna to resist to this, I'm gonna be a prisoner, or I'm gonna actually be a leader and lead my team through this, because I'll be honest, 
and my own immaturity, sometimes I resisted change and brought it to its knees because I could, mm -hmm. <laughs> not because I should. Mm -hmm. I was self-aware to realize, you know what? I don't like this, I'm gonna shut it down. Mm -hmm. Watch me, <laughs> I'm gonna prevent it from going to West because I'm stopping right here in Chicago. I'm guessing that's a little arrogant, but also not so unnatural for a lot of leaders. Right, no, it, it isn't because we all have different responses to change and we have different responses to in different times of the change. Yeah. So the very levels change, of maturity. Right? Yes, yeah. It, yeah, it's it, it's it's very similar. So in the zone of adoption where Andy has begun to speak of uh, speak to that, one of the things that in the sessions that I do in this content there's what you call the squiggly line, yeah. right? Because people are trying, and as leaders, we want them to try. We want to give them the freedom to try. Like, now that you have opted in, that point of decision is opting in, saying, okay, like, perhaps someone says to themselves, like, this change is going to happen. It's not going back, right? Mm -hmm. And I've got to either be a part of it or not be a part of it. And when you have an understanding of... It, when we one when we know where we are or where our people are in the change process it's so helpful to support them and if you could also name how are they feeling what is their response to change and it's different by the way different somebody could still be in the zone of disruption whereas others have gone through the point of decision and they're in the zone of adoption but they're trying different things and it's a squiggly line because people are trying things and realizing this isn't working or I don't like this and it almost feels like a whole new change. You know, at first blush, the book is a great leadership book. It's a great business book. Yeah. But it really is a great personal change book. Yes. You know me well, well enough that I was married in my early 40s. I was a bachelor all through my 20s and 30s, got married, and within nine days, my wife was pregnant. We had three boys in five years, which isn't very impressive in Utah, but you know, on the East Coast, that's a lot of kids. And so it rocked my world. I went from, you know, my clothes being color-coded in my closet, mm -hmm. and you can see the vacuum marks on my carpet and my loft in Chicago to, let's just face it, all hell broke loose. And I kind of wish, Andy, I'd had this book right before my marriage so that I could realize, oh, you know, the you know what's hitting the fan, Miller, oh where gosh. are you going to be? Take us there now to what is next, the zone of adoption. Now I've got three kids in five years and my life is unrecognizable. Yeah, I mean, you you had like just back to back serious disruptions. I mean, to be well, married. I had, what, I had what you did, like easy for you, but for me it was traumatizing. Yeah. So I mean, I think that's the thing that, and it's been fun to watch. Actually, I'm glad that you're, you know, that we're friends and that, and you're active on social media and sharing your experience uh, in being married and raising these wonderful boys. And the thing about it is, it is in our homes. There are so many changes. New job, kid tries a new sport. Aging um, parent. The, yeah, aging right, parents, right. another death. one. Death. Yeah. Death, moving to a new home, a new neighborhood, kids going to a new school. Losing your job. The skill sets that are involved in, or that we talk about in this book, are applicable in all of those different yeah. areas. But I think the thing is that it, it's so important that we recognize when we go through this zone of adoption and all the challenges with it, the end in mind is to get to that final zone. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do here is to really innovate out of this thing. This zone of innovation is to say, don't go through the dip and the change and get crushed by that and just get back to where you were. You got no value from the change. It was all loss. Yeah. And, and this is, I think, the biggest insight for us is to get at to the other side and go, let's leverage everything we learned in the wrestle, in the struggle, in the challenges, and let's put it to work in a way that helps make us better for having gone through the difficulty. And, and that happens at a personal level, it happens yeah. at an organizational level, it happens at a team level. That's one of the most powerful insights in the book, I think, is to leverage the difficulty of the change to come out having been better for it. Yeah, I call it leveling up. Yes. Yeah. I think the reason this book will become a bestseller I'm willing it so, mm -hmm. is because it has great applicability in your personal professional life. Marcia, you're quite vulnerable in the book. You talk about mm -hmm. your dad's passing early yeah. in life and how much you revered him, yeah. but also the role he'd played as caretaker, provider, yes. decision maker. Yes. And as, how old were you when your, your dad passed? Um, I was right out of college, maybe 22. Right, right. And you had been fairly dependent upon your father <laughs> as both a hero, but also him helping you make good decisions in yes. life. And you had to grasp, wrestle with, and pretty immediately realized, okay, that isn't happening anymore. Yes. I've got to learn this and do that and think this yes. way. I think it was a huge gift that you gave us yeah, in you. talking about change with personal application. Yeah. I want to pitch you both a final question. 
you both are road warriors for Franklin Covey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you have personal lives as well, too. You tend to teach, how many of our contents are you expert at? Mm. I can use the word expert, 15 plus. I mean, you teach <laughs> the seven habits and the speed of trust and project management and change. Yeah. I mean, Lots. and Andy, the same as you. You yeah. tend to split your time a little bit differently. Yeah. Marcia, you crisscross the nation and world working generally at first line, mid level, and senior level leaders, a lot of implementation company wide. Andy, you tend to spend most of your time at the executive level board work. Both are very valuable. Mm-hmm. Would you share when our clients are adopting the change solution? Mm-hmm. So we tend to write books about solutions we have in our past, and there's a, a, uh, a highly interactive, very easy to facilitate adopt change course that our mm-hmm. clients use. Yes. What's the biggest aha? that you find participants in the change course experience when they go through it? Yeah, I actually think it's exactly what I was speaking of just a moment ago, the squiggly line, the zone of adoption. I think that that is the biggest. You literally hear people, we show this video where it's explained initially, and then of course we go into depth with it, but people go like, ah, because they realize. That's where I was, yeah. or that's where I am. Yes. It's validating, isn't yes. it? I found it really kind of, maybe I should be embarrassed by it, but I thought, oh my gosh, it was a gift. Yeah. The squiggly line, I got the wrong zone, but yeah. it was say, yeah. this is where I am. You've given voice to the confusion and the paranoia yeah. Yeah. and the fear that I have. Yes, but the, the beautiful thing, and the thing I think people appreciate most is, in the zone of adoption, you're trying. So it's not one and done. It is really, you know, You're like iterative. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And and it's taking you somewhere. If you could stick with it, because actually, that is where, and we talk about this in our content course, that's where change often fails. Not in the zone of disruption mm. where it's introduced, but it fails typically in the zone of adoption where people are trying. What do I do now? And they just get where up. are we headed? And they get in, they get frustrated with I'm trying and this is not working. But if you keep trying, people are far more brilliant than sometimes leaders give them credit for, or that they even know themselves. So I also think it's an important role of a leader, because we increasingly see now the average lifespan of a career is like 18 months. You know, we've been in this company for two decades. <laughs> yeah. We're sort of dinosaurs. But I'm also seeing a little bit of a swing back. Because if you're a great leader, you're not just recruiting, you're retaining talent, and you're helping people see a vision for what it can be like. We're gonna, yeah. not just to go on LinkedIn and take the next offer, offer that gives them $10 more thousand yeah. dollars, but showing them how we're gonna get through the zone of adoption into innovation. Andy, I'm guessing you're seeing clients adopt the course as part of a visioning strategy to say, hey people, it's gonna be okay, it's we're huge. gonna get there. Almost every, it doesn't matter what content I'm in, I do a lot of strategy execution work, I do a lot of executive coaching, it doesn't matter what they're working on. Almost always they will say in my pre-consult with them to prepare for whatever I'm delivering or the work that I'm doing, they will say, we are going through so much change right now. And this model gives us a language, and, and all of us have shared experience and change, and that's the cool thing, and you're, you're referencing that, like I know that's where I am now, that's where I was then, that's the power of the model, is everybody goes, totally been there. I, I, it happened to me when I went to college, mm-hmm. it ha- you know, f- very young age, you're recognizing, yeah, I remember the, the change curve when my parents moved to a new neighborhood, mm-hmm. and I had to start a new high school as a junior. Yeah. That was like maybe the first thing, and then they go, yeah, and I remember what it was like to move away from home and what it was like to get my first job. When and you lost I, your hair. Yeah, ex- that was <laughs> a huge change. Yeah. But I've adapted very well. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, compliment Marche's comments about what do you see are the biggest challenges that leaders face, senior leaders? I mean, speak to the millions literally yeah. around the world of senior leaders right now that are listening to us that think, well, the problem's out there. If I could just get my people to adopt a change, if they could yeah. just, I'm guessing it starts with the leader first. Stephen M. R. Covey says, leaders go first. Yeah. Give some advice to the leaders on what they need to do more effectively, differently, yeah. to be part of the solution if they want to see change through. I think it's hard to get people t- to get to the point of decision to adopt to a change when you yourself have not yet mm. R- mm. made that decision. So you got to get to the decision first. But I think then you have to recognize, your own, your own yeah, decision. yeah, your yeah. own decision. Like, okay, I'm in. I'm going to do the ERP that was suggested by my. It may require you to learn something new or do exactly. something different. Or I, that out of your I own didn't choose zone. the new software. I just learned how to use the old software. Right. Now we've got to use this and or HR I brought it or whatever. It, you all. <laughs> Learn it. Exactly. And so I think there's this, you have to get to the point of decision bef- before anybody else mm. is going to get there, lead the way. 
But there's this other thing, you have to be patient with people yeah. because they're gonna get there at a different time. They're wrestling with different emotions than maybe I did. I might have been really excited about the change because I promoted it, where somebody else is just saying, I'm gonna resist it and historically, I've been able to make stuff go away and they're gotta take time to learn, like you're not gonna make this one go away. Right. You gotta get on board. I think this is golden, because what you're really harking back to is Dr. Covey's principles around leaders go first, mm -hmm. leaders model. That's right. If you want your sales staff to increase their number of face-to-face -face meetings, you have to leave the comfort of your fifth floor office and get in your car and go out and meet with clients. Yep. And your skills may not be what they need to be, and you may just need to say to your team, hey, this is gonna be awkward for me, I love the safety of my office, but I'm gonna show you the change that I'm gonna implement while I ask you to do the same. That's gotta be worth like gold to your team members to have them see you moving outside your comfort zone. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. You don't wanna add something to what uh, Andy just said. There, one of the things that I love about what we've done here in the book is it is one thing to convey we're doing change, make this happen. Yeah. It's a different I thing. I said so. Right. It's a different thing to communicate about the change and communicate through the entire change process mm -hmm. with empathy and with curiosity. Yeah. Right? So that this is really, really, I love Andy, um, whenever we talk about it, he, he talks, uh, reverences um, our content as a competency, mm -hmm. right? And it really is because if it's it's leadership, embracing and leading through change is a leadership competency. It is a leadership yeah, competency, well and yeah. and all that we're talking about is really how do we how do we hone that? What is it exactly do you do as a leader? Congratulations on writing this book. I'm 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 honored to be on set with the two of you. Uh, you've joined. Curtis Bateman and Dr. Christy Phillips, two colleagues also in the company. The new book is Change, How to Turn Uncertainty into Opportunity. Great to see you both. Thank Thanks, you Scott. so much. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. Mm -hmm.